What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Before we get into today's conversation with Mr. Junho3, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. Number one, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please consider leaving a rating and a review. The more positive ratings and reviews we get, the more it helps new people find the show, and it really helps to grow the community that we're developing here. And if you're one of those people that have recently found the podcast, welcome. I'm very excited to have you here. Make sure you subscribe and stay tuned for future episodes. And to everybody listening, make sure you screenshot this, post it to your Instagram story, tag at the Jacob Kelly and at Mr. Dean Ho 3 And I'll feature you on the account and send you a message as well. And now, without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Mr. Junho 3 What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly, and today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. And today we are joined by Raymond Kim. And Ray is the creator and founder of the Instagram account and business, Mr. Junho3. He has over 400,000 followers on Instagram and on his account, he shares outfit grids of his daily wardrobe. And for his business, he sells clothing boxes that he and his stylists handpick to help men dress with confidence. I'm also happy to say this is Ray's first ever interview, and I'm honored that he decided to come on the podcast for his first one. Ray, welcome to the show. Hey, Jacob. Thank you so much for having me. Truly a pleasure, and I'm excited to chat. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it where I want to start. Before we before we even get into Instagram, I'm curious if you could just give me a little bit of a background. Like before you ever started Instagram, like where are you from? Where did you grow up? And what were you doing prior to Instagram? Sure. So <clears throat> I was born in Chicago. I moved out to Los Angeles in 2008 for the first um, three years of my career here. I worked in advertising. Um, and then shortly after that, I moved on over to um, the publisher side. I worked at Edmonds. Um, I worked at Auto Trader and then Kelly Blue Book. So I was there for about eight years total. And then in November of 2018, I actually just branched off and I started my own digital marketing company. So I've been doing this for, for about a year and a half and um, it's been quite the journey. Wow, that's awesome. So I didn't know that. So I'll probably dive into that a little bit later on. But where... so. Ultimately, with your personal Instagram, correct me if I'm wrong, but you would have started in September 2016 was when you started the account? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So like, why did you decide to start? Like, Kind of bring me back to that, sure. to that month there where you were thinking about starting the account. Like, What eventually made you start posting? Sure, sure. So I've always had a passion for marketing and fashion um, for the longest time, even in high school. I just remember um, I just got complimented a lot on like how I dress. So that fashion side to me has always been rooted within me. And then marketing is my passion. That's what I live. That's what I breathe. And in September of 2016, you know, I was just sitting on my couch. I was going through Instagram and I saw that a lot of people were, um, you know, there was a lot of men's influencers, but there weren't many that were doing those outfit grids. And the reason why I like those outfit grids so much is because you're just kind of removing the model out of the picture and you're able to kind of insert yourself into this, you know, this layout of clothes that's on the floor. So, you know, I was just thinking more and more and I shared this idea with a few friends and they loved it. Um, there was a few people that were doing this, but I would say I was one of the first 10 to do it on Instagram. And I just kind of, you know, I just wanted to try it. Um, and I just started off by, pulling some clothes out of my closet. And then I arranged them, put them on the floor. Um, and then, yeah, the rest is history. Um, been doing this for almost four years. I've made over a thousand outfit grids, but, um, you know, I've been uh, blessed to, I guess, be at 450K, but also just meet a lot of cool people along the way. And do you remember that first ever outfit grid that you put together and posted? <laughs> yes, I do. It was actually, um, it was a fully blown out, like, tuxedo with like dress pants um like the watch and it's funny because that's not who I that's not how I really dress so that was just kind of more more of a experiment that I did that just kind of um kind of taught me a lot really quickly I kind of followed that um that theme for a little bit and I quickly learned that on Instagram the the demographics are a lot younger so um i quickly just kind of optimize i tweak into a bit more casual wear and that's kind of where i find my niche and so i'm curious then with 
realizing what people on Instagram want to see in terms of the clothes you're posting. And obviously you're going to be ha- having to update your wardrobe from time to time. Does Instagram now influence the kind of clothes you buy when you go to the store? Um, you know, it actually does not because I've, I'm like a, a firm believer that, you know, like everyone has their own style and it's just very important for them to stick with their own style. So I'm not really influenced by honestly, like other, the way that other people dress. I always just try to, um, just kind of build on what I like by describing, I guess, like inspiration from, it's not even close to, you know, as funny as that may sound like I might find like a part of like, um, like this image that I like that has like a really cool color that I want to try mixing into an outfit grid or like, I find this like really cool texture on you know, a car seat that I try to find a garment that like kind of resembles, you know, that fabric. So um, yeah, it's just, you know, I, I find inspiration in like the weirdest places. But um, I think the most important thing is just like kind of staying true to, you know, like your style and just kind of evolving with it. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. The, the authenticity is really important. And you mentioned there too, that today you're sitting at 450,000 followers on Instagram. When you were taking that first photo, did you did you think even that like maybe there's a chance that this becomes as big as it's become, or is this just beyond what you ever imagined? No, it's it's way beyond what I ever imagined. Honestly, I remember when I first started it, I was talking to my wife and I was like, "Hey, you know, if we hit like ten thousand, I think it's gonna be like so amazing." And I think I hit ten thousand in like the first two months or two two three months, and then I was like, "Okay, I think we have something." something going here and then um yeah it just it was just like a snowball effect after that but no never imagined um me to be in this position um but you know i'm i'm very blessed yeah so you mentioned it grew pretty quickly off the bat and when i did i did the deep scroll i went all the way through the th- over a thousand photos down to the first one and by the time october had come around you already had your first sponsorship one of the early photos on your account is a photo sponsored by forever 21 was it surprising to you when clothing companies started to reach out to you and offer to sponsor posts on your account? You know, it was, um, I, for like the first month, um, I was just kind of just grabbing what was in my closet and I was kind of worried. Cause like, I thought I would eventually just kind of run out of content to create, but you know, um, a funny story with forever 21, you know, there's this 5149 model that I, you know, that I go by, which is, um, giving value before taking value. So with Forever 21, um, I actually, you know, I hit them up. I was like, hey, you know, I don't have that many followers, but um, I want to grow with you. And I think that selling point is what really kind of, that was kind of the hook. And usually what I do with sponsored posts is I do one post and one Instagram story. But with Forever 21, I was like, hey, I will give you 20 pieces of content. I'll create 20 outfit grids for you if you give me one feature on your main Instagram feed. So they obviously loved it because they're getting a lot of marketing material for, you know, themselves and, you know, they were able to use it. And, you know, till this day, I still work with Forever 21. So um, yeah, it's been, um, it's been awesome. And so when you say you produce 20 pieces of creative, was that 20 outfit grids or are you producing other material for them? That's not just outfit grids. No, it's actually just outfit grids. So they sent me, um, I think like 10 or 15 pieces of clothing and I was just kind of mixing and matching and um, I created 20 and then I sent it over to them. They loved it. And um, yeah, that's what I did. Mm, that's interesting. So, and you said that they ended up posting a one photo for you on their grid as well, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. On their main feed. And I remember um, in a 72 hour span, like I grew three or 4,000 followers. So, um, you know, to me, like me, that was a lot more important just because I was getting some good brand exposure. And once Forever 21 posted that, it actually opened up a lot of new opportunities as well. And a lot of new brands found me. So again, I think if you are um, an aspiring influencer that's trying to grow, I really believe that you need to provide more value than um, asking for, um, you know, than asking for it back. And one thing I'm curious about too, is despite the fact that you, especially compared to now, had a smaller following at that time, Mm-hmm. less than 10,000 followers. Where did you get the idea to reach out to Forever 21 and think maybe if I just ask them, they'll send me free clothing in return for me posting it? Like, where did you get that idea from? 
Yeah, so Forever 21, um, I when I was in high school, I shopped a lot at Forever 21 and I wanted to um, work with them just because like, you know, they're just a global brand. They have stores like literally in every parts of the world. So I knew that if I can get in front of that audience and just because so many eyes are on Forever 21, that it would just open a lot of doors for me. So it started off by, um, you know, as a brand that I liked in high school and, you know, and then that kind of evolved into just um, working with them when I started the Instagram feed. And so was most of your growth attributed to you reaching out and collaborating with brands and then doing strategic collaborations where you'll post for them and then they'll post a couple of your outfit grids in their feed as well? Is that the main source of how you grew or were there any other tactics you used to try and grow early on? Right. So I would say um, up until about 50,000 followers, that's what I did with a lot of brands, just because I knew that, you know, like I'll be, I'll probably be able to make money later on, but what's more important is building a firm foundation. So from zero to 50, that was my strategy. And then from 50 and on, um, that's when the brand started to kind of find me just because I had a bigger audience. I was reaching more people. So, um, yeah, I would say zero to 50 is when I reached out and then 50 and beyond, I would say that's when brands, um, reached out to me more. Gotcha. And I was looking at some Instagram analytics and I think it was, maybe this was the, the big growth you just, you previously mentioned, but in January of 2017, I saw somewhere that it looked like you grew over 10,000 followers in two to three days. Would that have been from a brand posting about your account? Yes. Um, I I don't remember which collaboration that was, but it was January. It was probably through some, a few collaborations. And there was also a time on Instagram when it was a lot easier to grow too. So I remember, I think 10,000 was probably like at my peak, but I remember like I was growing four to 6,000 per week for the longest time. And then every time when Instagram updates their algorithm, that's when it gets a little bit harder. So, um, yeah, it goes in waves, but yeah, I would say I grew the fastest around that time. And so as you're having the the rapid growth gaining, like you said, four to 6,000 followers a week on average, as that number starts to grow, does pressure start to mount with you? Like, is there added pressure when it comes to posting to make sure you're consistent or making sure there's like specific outfits you're posting? Like, is there any added pressure with more people? Sure. Um, that's a great question. I think t- honestly, not really. Um, just because I, I kind of touched on this earlier, but I kind of just stick to my style. I know what I like. I, I know what colors do well. I know what angles do well. I know what brands do well. Like I know when, what time of the day I need to post. I'm like very heavy on the analytics and that was actually just kind of what kind of kickstarted everything too. I remember um, when I first started, I was like literally like I created an Excel spreadsheet. I was logging in my daily posts by color, by angle, like by brand, like in in, like the craziest ways as you can, like you probably can't even imagine. But that actually really helped me to find um, a common theme that hit well with my audience. So um, I don't I wouldn't say that I get like nervous or if it's more pressure um, just because I just kind of know what hits and I kind of know my style. So I just try to stick with it. And so when, when you say that, like, you know, you're, you know, what works, what uh-huh. time of like, are you still posting every single day or are you, have you changed the, the frequency at all? Right. So, um, it's cu- currently I'm posting more towards the evening just because this new Instagram algorithm, it's a trickier one. So I'm trying to refine my my sweet spot to post. And right now I'm currently having more success posting in the evening. So I'll kind of mix it up, but um, currently it's like more towards the evening. Okay. And so with the content then, like you said, you know, the angles, you know, the brands, are sure. you taking new photos every day or do you just bulk shoot and lay your outfits out? For example, like say every Sunday morning, you lay out seven right. different outfits, take seven photos to post throughout the week. Right. So I bulk shoot. I, that usually happens on Sunday and I will probably take about 14 photos on Sunday and I'll use seven that I really like up front. And then I'll probably save the last seven um, more for um, like the future. So I oftentimes I do like carousels or like, um, you know, I do like I, I would use them for Instagram stories. But yeah, I would take about 14 pieces of content on Sunday for the um, coming week. 
Okay. And what, like, in terms of gear, I'm always curious what people are using to produce their Instagram photos. Do you have sure. a camera you use? Or are you just using your phone? Is there any lighting or anything? What kind of gear are you using? Sure. It's a good old iPhone. I, I use an iPhone 10. And as far as lighting, just natural lighting, and as far as the the floor that I shoot on, it's literally just my office floor. I see. I think that's awesome though. Cause I think that's a good thing for people to hear, right? Like you have an account with 450,000 followers and you're using the light from a window and your phone. Like people, I feel like they often overcomplicate what kind of gear they need to start posting and grow an audience. But realistically, all you need is your phone. And it's just cool to hear that. That's why I asked. I was curious as to what you were using. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I think a lot of times um, people just kind of overthink things, right? Like they try to create this beautiful photo. It has to be perfect. If there's one flaw, they can't post it. But, um, you know, like I think a lot of times people try to find content that they can relate to. And I feel like when it's just too perfect, it just doesn't feel natural. So, you know, there are, as funny as it may sound, like there are some photos where like, like my toes will be in the picture, like part of my toes or like, you know, the lighting might be a little bit off or, you know, like there's a bit more, there's like a little too much shadow in the photo, but you know, I think it's like those photos that like people can really relate to. And, and honestly, I think that's what they like too. Yeah. And like you mentioned your floor there, the floor being the floor in your office, mm -hmm. what happens if you ever move? Like what happens if you have a different floor? Like what do you do at that point? Um, funny that you asked that. So um, the first, Three years I was shooting on my apartment floor, and then last year I actually um, I moved, and the flooring you probably can't tell. I don't know how it worked out this way, but the floor actually is like my current floor is actually pretty similar to my apartment floor. It's a little bit darker, but um, you know, as long as I can find some hardwood or some laminate that has you know a similar color, it it doesn't matter where I am. I can still get it done. And, and is there a method to how you lay your clothes on the floor? Like, is there like some people might look at it, they might just see you folding clothes and putting them on the floor, but is it more strategic? Is there a method to how you do it? So um, there's two different layouts that I stick to. And the reason why I stick to those two layouts is because um, they generate the most engagement based on the analytics that I kind of uh, ran on my own. So one would be um, pants on the left, shoes on the bottom, and then the shirt or whatever the top is on the right. And then the other one is more of um, a square where it's the shirt on the right and then accessories right below it. And then we have um, the shoes on the bottom left and then jeans on the top left. And those are the two layouts I think that, um, that people are able to just kind of relate to the most. So I just tend to stick with those because I know it works. And I kind of, I want to dive a little bit further into analytics. I think it's, I think it's fascinating that you were able to look at your analytics and see which clothing layout led to more engagement. So when you're going through your insights, what analytics are you keying in on? Is it purely just likes and comments? Is it the sense of a post? Like what are you looking for when you're measuring engagements of a post? Right. So I look at likes, I look at the amount of comments that I get. I also look at um, reach and impression. So I kind of look at everything um, as a whole, but the most important thing to me is um, the, co the number of comments and the overall um, likes on the post. Okay. And so one thing I was curious too, because for the most part, for like all intents and purposes, you've remained pretty anonymous with your Instagram, right? Yes, correct. So first question is where does the name Mr. Junho come from? And then two, once I was just generally curious about that, but in terms of with people commenting on your photo and stuff, how do you build a community while remaining anonymous? Right. So Mr. Chuno three. Um, so Chuno is actually my Korean name. And then um, number three is growing up. I loved watching Ellen Iverson play and number three was my favorite number. So I couldn't think of a better name at that time. So I just kind of put like Mr. Chuno three because together, because I thought it kind of flowed well. But the funny thing is, like, I was actually planning to change my name. But, you know, after a few months, and I hit, you know, 10,000 followers, I was just kind of stuck with it. So that's how Mr. Shuna 3 came along. And um, I'm sorry, what was what was the second part of the question? The second part of the question is, well, actually, first, I actually have a follow up question is what was the name going to be? Were you going to change the name to your actual name? Or what were you going to change it to? I, 
I was just going to change it to Chunho. And that is, it's taken and kind of sucks because it's actually an inactive account. Um, I don't think this person uses it at all. So I'm kind of bummed that I wasn't able to get it. But I mean, at this at this moment, Mr. Chunho 3 is trademarked. So either way, I, I can't change it. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. I mean, it's always tough when you find the the account name you want and it's an inactive account. But uh, my my other question was, so with remaining anonymous, how are you able to build a community on Instagram without people having like, like you have your photo there, but it's kind of, it's shadowy and it's not your real, it's not your, your name attached to the account. So how do you build a community with people? Yeah, so I actually comment a lot on um, other people's comments. And I actually go to a lot of my followers page and comment as well, just because I know that engagement is just so important. That community that you build is literally everything. So because I'm not showing my actual face, I try to just engage with my followers a lot. You know, I would go go on their account, you know, write comments on their photos, you know, send them DMs saying thank you for following. So I would do a lot of the little things just because, you know, I'm not kind of, I'm not putting myself out there. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's the little things that make the biggest difference when it comes to social media. And so like how much time then would you say you're spending on Instagram between taking the photos, posting them, writing the captions? Because some people I think underestimate how long it can take to write a caption for Instagram. Plus you're engaging with people. Plus I'm sure you're getting DMs of people asking for style tips all the time. So like how much time are you spending on Instagram in a given week? Sure. Well, currently I would say I spend about an hour a day, about 10, about 15 minutes goes into the actual, um, the photo and then the remaining 45, I'm responding to comments and also just kind of engaging with my community. That's crazy. I think that's another thing too. I don't think people realize the amount of time it actually takes yeah. to manage an account of that size. But yeah, it's, it's like, it's like a full-time job. And, um, but you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm very thankful for it. So it's, it's fun for me at the end of the day. So it's all good. That's good. Yeah. That's important. As long as you're still having fun with it. And I was curious too. So as you've built, I built a, a good following, a solid community on Instagram. What's your approach to other social media platforms? Do you spend any significant periods of time on other platforms? I kind of did some initial searching on my own. And it looks like to me, I think you, you, I'm assuming you share your Instagram posts to Facebook. Yes. Yeah. And then yeah. Is, is Pinterest still an active part of your strategy? You know, it's not. Um, Pinterest was for a minute, but um, just because the majority of my followers are are men, um, Pinterest tends to skew a bit higher um, with females. So I wasn't, I, I stopped doing Pinterest and I just fully focused on um, just kind of building out my Instagram. And also, um, I also have a website where I, I, set, I sell these subscription boxes. So um, I just stick with Instagram and I use that to just mainly drive traffic to my website. Gotcha. So talk to me about these subscription boxes then. At what point did you decide to start producing these and marketing them through your Instagram? Was it around the same time where you left to do your own digital marketing business in 2018? Um, no. So it was a little bit before that. Um, I just remember like I, I like for the first two years, I just got so many DMs about people asking if they can buy, you know, the clothes that I feature in my outfit grid. So at that time, I wasn't quite sure like how to deliver on this, but you know, I found a few vendors that wanted to uh, partner up with me. So it's really just kind of a form of drop shipping. Um, so I work with these vendors. I kind of switch them out every month, but you know, um, whoever the partner is for the month, if an order comes in, I will send it to the vendor and they will actually fulfill it. So this is something that I've been doing for a few years. Um, I have two, two boxes. One is a smaller one and the other is um, more of a seasonal box with more pieces. But this whole uh, subscription box thing was really designed um, as a way for me to kind of create an even more personal relationship with my audience. And I think it, I was able to do that by just offering this service and, um, and just because it, it's an obvious tie to like the, of the content that I create. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. So with the suppliers that you're working with on a given month, is that, so are you, are you picking out the clothes you want in the box? So once someone orders it, you know, what's going to be in each box that goes to your followers. 
Yeah. So when an order comes in, I will email them and I'll ask them a little bit about their um, their fashion style, like what they're looking for, what they don't like. And based off their response, I will personally just kind of pick out a few things and then I'll ask the, the supplier to put it in the box and ship it. So again, I think it's just a very personalized, personalized experience because I think fashion is very personal. So that's kind of the approach that I go with. Interesting. So you handpick each individual box. I then. do. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Do you have, do you have a team? Do you have anybody helping you pick these out or are you still doing it all by yourself? Um, so currently I do have a small team and they, they help me with my overall business. So, um, they help me kind of choose things too. But, um, for the first, yeah, like for the first few years, it was just kind of me doing it. And then now that, you know, I have my own digital marketing company, um, I, I don't have as much time. So that's when, you know, my team kind of steps in and helps, but I, I do take a look at everything that is picked out still. So, um, I am kind of still monitoring. Yeah. I was, I was actually going to be my next question is how do you then with fashion, like you said, being such an individual experience with everyone having their own individual tastes, I'm sure when people come to you and they purchase a subscription box from you, one, they're going to give you some input on what they like, but two, they're also trusting you as an expert in the space. So how do you find when you're hiring team members and stylists to help you put these boxes together mm -hmm. how do you find people that can also have a good grasp of your fashion sense as well because that's such a key component to why your followers shop from you that's actually a really great question um so what i what i do is like i kind of sit down with them and i go through my outfit grid and i actually ask them questions you know i would ask them like what are some common themes that you see um like what you know what colors like pop out more like i tr i ask a lot of questions and just based on their responses, that's when I kind of like either correct them a little bit or, you know, like, you know, tell them that they're correct. But I think um, that helped um, that helps them to choose the best items for customers, because just as I do, I go through their feed and, you know, I ask them questions and, you know, based on the experience that they get going through my feed and that little exercise, you know, I feel like that really helps them choose the right items when an order comes in uh, from a customer. And how has the business been impacted since COVID-19 hit? Has it, I'm assuming, like this is me just guessing, but I would assume that with stores and everything being closed, would that have seen, would you have seen an increase in a spike in sales during this time? So March was tough. Um, sales were definitely down, but the latter, the second half of April and May were actually like the busiest months. Um, so it was really interesting how that unfolded. And at the end of the day, I would say it's been, I would say it's like, it's been, um, it's been good overall, but yeah, I did see a little bit of a hit in March and early April, but you know, since then it's picked back up and, um, it's been a lot better. Okay. That's awesome. And so are the stylists for your subscription boxes they're not it's not the same staff that's with the marketing business is it is it two separate businesses or are they kind of under one roof no so they're actually um under one roof so um the people that help out with my marketing business are the ones that are helping me with my um, subscription boxes as well okay that's awesome so you said that the, so the marketing business would have started in 2018 then you said correct and it was kind of the intent behind that one is you've grown on Instagram, you understand the nuance of the platform, you can then take everything you've learned growing your account and then transfer that and help businesses grow theirs. Was that kind of the intent and the thought behind starting your own marketing agency? Exactly. So um, just working as an influencer, you know, I've worked with hundreds of brands. So I understand that landscape really well. And with my clients, um, you know, I'm representing them and reaching out to influencers. So it's, it's, it's kind of funny, but like, I guess like I kind of cover all ends of the spectrum um, just because like I have this kind of unique experience where, you know, I'm an influencer and also, you know, um, a digital marketing company that represents my clients as well. So um, it's, um, it's definitely been helpful in like, the transition through everything just because I was able to apply um, what I've learned in my, my earlier part of my career in advertising and then um, later on. So it's just, I guess I just kind of made a full circle if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, definitely. And with actually with your early career in advertising, was there anything that impacted the way you went about handling your Instagram when you first started it? That's a great question. Um, so 
The most important thing that I learned in advertising is um, creating an experience that people won't forget. So more than selling something, it's the experience that people really hold to heart and never forget. So I would say that's my biggest takeaway from the advertising world. And that's something that I've applied to, um, you know, like all aspects of my business for Instagram specifically. I, I try to do a lot of giveaways and I try to give back to the community because again, like those are the things that I think kind of hits well with people. And that's kind of the things that people really can relate to. So like even during Christmas, you know, one year I did um, 20, I think it was like 28 days of straight giveaways, just giving back to my audience. I partnered with, I partnered with 28 brands, held a giveaway every day, gave something away. And, you know, I, I, I love doing that. I also like to participate in like um, different campaigns where we're donating to charity to different organizations. So um, it's the experience that, um, that I learned from advertising and the emotions that are tied to um, building a relationship. That's just like something that I've always kind of like held to my heart and try to apply it everywhere. Mm. No, I think it's an important thing for people to hear. And at the end of the day, people will always remember how you made them feel. They might not remember your exact caption or your exact post, but they'll remember how the emotions that you invoked within them. You mentioned too that you, you've worked with hundreds of brands over the time of doing your Instagram. And so with that in mind, I'm sure your inbox is constantly getting flooded with brands reaching out to you. So I'm curious, just one, how, like, if you were to ballpark, how many emails and DMs from companies and brands are you getting in a week? And then how do you decide which ones to work with and which ones not to? Sure. Um, I would say currently, I mean, I feel like I'm getting about tw- at least 25 to 30 emails um, per week. Um, and then probably like 10 to 15 DMs. So I would say about maybe like 50 DMs, emails per week. But how do I decide who to work with? Um, I kind of reached a point where um, like I, I can get a little bit more selective with who I work with. So I tend to only work with brands that I just truly, truly believe in that I can relate to um, and, you know, brands that I really like want to support. So it's just truly just kind of based on that. Um, a lot of these opportunities, you know, like some are good, some are not that great, but um, I think just because of the position that I'm in now, I'm able to kind of pick and choose a little bit more. So yeah, I just like to choose the brands that um, that I would just support even if there was no like money or anything else tied to it. And so then does being, does being a fashion influencer limit the types of sponsors you can work with? Like from yeah. your experience, do you only really work with clothing companies or have you found ways to work with other companies? Right. So because I don't put my face out on my Instagram feed, it's mainly just clothing companies. But um, a lot of my colleagues or, you know, my friends that are also influencers that actually do lifestyle shots, they're able to get um, more brand deals. Like they would, get, I, I know a lot that get invited um, by hotels, by airlines, to travel, um, that get invited, that get um, sponsorship opportunities with like, um, you know, different liquor brands and, a whole lot more. So for me, it's a little bit more limited, um, just because my face is not out there. But, um, but it's okay. Like my, my main focus is my digital marketing company. So, you know, it, it allows me to kind of um, shift my attention elsewhere and just kind of like work on other things. So um, yeah, it's, it's, that's how it kind of is right now. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a thought for you to do like a face reveal or anything like that to try and start dabbling in that influencer marketing space where you're getting other things outside of just fashion and clothes or are you perfectly happy with where you're at being anonymous it's funny because like i've been thinking more and more about actually kind of putting my face out there but you know like i've gotten this far um by sticking to um you know specific style and and i feel like that's why a lot of my followers follow me anyway so most likely i probably won't put my face out there um just because this is just kind of what Mr. Chuna 3 is. Mm -hmm. And one thing I was going to ask too is, usually when I prep for these podcasts, I do a deep dive into the internet. I try and find as much as I possibly can. But you've done an impressive job of keeping the amount of information about you on the internet to a minimum. 
How have you been able to do that, especially with such a successful Instagram account? Do you have a successful digital marketing business now? Like, how have you been able to keep yourself personally off of the internet? Because I feel like that's such a difficult thing to do. That's kind of funny that you asked because, um, you know, I've been asked a lot, but I, for me, just like I'm a private person in general. So I just try to not put myself out there too much. And it's not by like, it's not by design or anything. It's just like kind of who I am as a person. So I think because I'm just like more of a private person, that's why you probably just don't see a whole lot of me on the internet. Yeah, no, that's fair. I was just curious. I think like I, so when I searched up your Instagram name, I think there's only like four pages on Google that you could get. And I usually try and go five pages deep and there wasn't even five pages. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is just impressive. How like how little information you've been able to share online. Do you Do you still use like kind of on that vein, do you ever use social media in a personal capacity then? Or do you just stick to your influencer account and that's it? Yeah. So, I mean, I have my own personal page, um, just like everyone else. And on that page, I show my face, with, you know, I'm with my family and friends, but um, for Mr. Tuna 3, yeah, I, I, I don't. And, you know, the funny thing is though, um, you can actually find pictures of me on the internet because <laughs> I've, I actually teach courses and I do a few other things. So um, yeah, it, like overall, I'm just like, I'm a private person, but if you kind of dig around a little bit, um, you can actually find a little bit more about me. <laughs> yeah. And so when you said those, those courses, that's on Skillshare, right? So um, I did something with Skillshare in the past, but um, I actually just, I teach a few courses with this company called Influency. Um, it's social media marketing. I just talk about how to grow your following. So um, yeah, that was actually just kind of released in the past few weeks. But th the reason why you probably can't find it is because it's kind of one of those like paid subscription, paid subscription model. So um, yeah, you can only really see the content if you pay for it. Got you. But tell yep. me a little bit more about that. Like how did that opportunity come up where you're teaching courses and what exactly are the courses you're teaching? Yep. So it's all, um, it's all social media courses and um, this company, you know, contacted me and they were just kind of, um, they were just looking for influencers from um, different, um, you know, different industries that can kind of contribute and teach their students. So um, I was kind of debating for a while if I should do it or not, just because like this is actually a video recording. So I just decided to do it. And um, in, in the courses, I talk about the importance of engagement, you know, using the right hashtags, understanding your analytics, how to collaborate with brands and um, just a few other things. So um, it's just a one hour course that I teach um, that is uh, like a very simplified version of kind of like how you can grow your your personal brand um at a at a faster rate got you so it's from the perspective of someone that wants to become an influencer as opposed to helping a brand scale exactly it's more of an uh how, yeah the influencer yep got you and so you mentioned like using specific hashtags what's your approach to doing that because i feel like everyone has a slightly different approach to using hashtags so with hashtags, um, what I do for myself and with clients is I create these four buckets. Um, the four buckets are big hashtags, medium hashtags, um, community hashtags, and micro community hashtags. And I create a list of about 100 hashtags and I actually bucket them. And what I do is I use um, some from every bucket. I, I use more from the micro and the community buckets. Um, because they're smaller hashtags. But what I do is I do 30 hashtags per post and um, I would post that as a first comment. But I am constantly changing those hashtags because one thing that um, happens a lot that a lot of people actually don't know about is if you use the same hashtags, you're, you get shadow banned, right? And when, once you're shadow banned, that's when Instagram kind of marks your account as spam and it kind of takes a while to get yourself out of that hole. So um, with hashtags, I'm focusing on 25 to 30 hashtags per post, but I'm just constantly kind of changing them out just so that, you know, the, the hashtags are fresh and it doesn't raise any flags um, uh, by Instagram. And like, what's the cadence then you use in terms of switching out those hashtags? Is it Yep. every post that you switch them out maybe every week like what's that look like yep so um every seven days i i switch them out um and i think that's kind of the sweet spot i think if you go beyond 14 and 21 days um that's when a lot of your hashtags will be uh, shadow banned and your content won't show so seven days is what i like to stick with okay and like with in terms of just knowing that too that 
eventually if you use the same hashtags over and over again, you'll get shadow banned through the way Instagram's algorithm work. Where do you go to stay up to date with the algorithm? Because obviously it changes so frequently and they don't necessarily post when the algorithm updates, how it works. Like, where do you go to learn and how do you stay on top of that? It, honestly, this is something that like, there's no right answer. So I just do a lot of research. I, I watch YouTube videos. I see what, you know, other people are talking about. And usually you can find a common theme across um, all of these resources. So I try to find a common theme and I just kind of stick with it. But again, like just like everyone else, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I just tend to kind of follow what a lot of people say. Mm -hmm. No, that's fair. That's just, that's always something I'm curious about as to how people try to stay on top of the algorithm with it changing so much. Uh, but kind of with that in mind, with Instagram as a whole, Looking back, if you had the opportunity and the ability to go back and talk to yourself the day before you started posting on Instagram, what is one thing you would tell yourself? Um, wow, that's a, that's a great question. I would probably say experimenting with um, different color backdrops. That's one thing that I that I have not done that I've always been curious about. But um, I think that would be it. I think colors are just so important. Um, as part of your content. And I would have loved to, um, you know, I would have loved to try different backdrops just to see how that performs and how that changes, you know, the amount of engagements that I get proposed. Yeah, that's actually something I wanted to ask you about in terms of the background and with, with the background always being consistent and with you understanding exactly how to lay your clothes out to get the most engagement. When you're working with a brand, have you ever had a difficulty difficulty working with a brand where they try to direct the creative look of the grid so much that you have to kind of push back because you know how it works, but they want to look a certain way, whether it be changing the backdrop or whatever it is? Like, have you ever had a challenge with a brand trying to change how you go about doing your outfit grids? Yeah, so that happened a few times. And, you know, it's honestly fair game. I think a lot of times these brands, like, you know, they want to get the most out of um, that influencer partnership. So I completely understand I'll always hear them out, but um, I always kind of back that up with my analytics. I show examples of why this works better. And usually when that happens, you're, you're actually like kind of gaining their trust, which is very important. But number two, um, you're kind of like also sh showing that you're trying to put them in the best position to win. So at the end of the day, um, yes, I've had a few brands that were a bit more difficult to work with, but it actually all worked out at the end um, just because I was able to, you know, provide some hard facts and, you know, proof that, you know, this method works better. Mm -hmm. There's one specific collaboration I wanted to ask you about. I don't even know if it's actually an official collab, but you posted a grid of a bunch of Gary V stuff. Was that a collaboration you did with Gary and Team Gary V? Or is that from just being a fan of Gary himself? Yeah, so actually, um, I've been a fan of Gary ever since he started Wine Library. And I've wine is actually another passion of mine, but we can get into that later. But with Gary V, um, yeah, it's someone that I, I looked up to, that I admired. And I actually hit up Gary V's team and I kind of pitched, the, pitched them this concept of creating this outfit grid for Gary V, promoting his book. And um, at that time, when we did this collaboration, um, the most recent post that you saw was actually a repost um, that was originally posted a few years ago. But when I approached the Gary Vee team, you know, they were they've never had this type of collaboration before because, you know, Gary Vee is a motivational speaker. He's, you know, a marketing entrepreneur. So he had some merch and um, to them, I think they just found it kind of interesting. So, you know, I pitched them this idea. They sent me over, um, you know, a book and some clothes and I created this outfit grid for Gary. So that's how it kind of um, started. But again, like that kind of went back to my 5149 model. And, you know, I wanted to provide more value. So, you know, I, I, I feel like I over delivered on that just because I wanted to be part of the Gary Vee conversation and I wanted to be seen um, in front of his audience. So, yeah, it, it worked out at the end. Mm -hmm. It's like with kind of that in mind where being a fan of Gary from the Wine Library days and doing a collaboration with him. Are there some places that Instagram has taken you where you kind of ha that you never could have expected? Where you kind of had to stop and be like, "Whoa, look where I am right now!" And it's all because of Instagram. Yeah, like I've been invited a to a lot of like fashion events, a lot of conventions, and um, yeah, it's just like things like that I would never expected. Um, you know, when I first started my feed, so 
it's definitely created some really cool opportunities and um, I'm very thankful for that. And what's people's reaction when they meet you in person for the first time? Like for you, must like I usually ask people what's it like to get recognized, but that's probably a problem that you don't ever have where people don't recognize you. But what's it like when people find out that you're the person behind the Instagram? Um, it's kind of funny. Like we just kind of laugh about it, but they're like, oh, like you're this mystery guy and I finally met you. And, um, you know, it's all fun and games, but yeah, it's... Um, it's usually just, it's kind of more, um, it, it's, it's a light experience where, you know, we're just talking about this mystery guy and, um, you know, how we finally met. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, what do you, what do you think your end goal with Instagram is? My end goal? Um, I, I use Mr. Chuno three a lot, to be honest, um, when I pitch new businesses, cause I show proof that, you know, I'm able to grow Instagram feeds. I do this not from my own not only for myself, but for other clients as well. So, you know, I think with Instagram, it's just really just continuing to grow it, continue to just, you know, build the engagement and just trying to um, make the most out of my Instagram feed. So my long-term goal is just to continue using it to help uh, me get new business and just helping men just, you know, dress more with confidence. So I would say that's it. If you had to start all over again tomorrow, would you? No, <laughs> just because... Um, I've put in a lot of work to build this and it's, um, it definitely, you know, it's been a huge part of my life for the past four years. And as, um, as great as it has been, I think, yeah. And especially cause now it's like even harder to grow and I feel like I got in at the right time. So I would say, um, I'm happy with where I am right now, but if I had to start over tomorrow, I would really have to think about that. So talk to me too a little bit before we get into kind of the wrap up questions, just a little bit of some of your hobbies outside of Instagram. You mentioned you're into wine. Is there any other interests that you don't like that you would love to portray kind of through your social media, but you can't because you're tied to being a fashion influencer? Yeah, I would definitely say um, I love to travel and I would love to incorporate that more into my Instagram feed. And actually, I actually do that a bit more through Instagram stories. Whenever I travel, um, you know, I'm just showing videos, um, just pictures. So I do a little bit of that. That's fair. And so kind of, I know it's tougher now with COVID and everything, but what's next for you? What do you have coming up? You know, I'm actually just working on um, a few campaigns where, you know, we're able to help um, different nonprofits get a bit more exposure through my Instagram. So that's in the works. I'm also working on another campaign where um, we can kind of give back and um, provide more medical masks for um, hospitals. I've done that a few times in the past. And like, to me, it, it's just so important to just use my platform to give back. So I'll be doing a little bit of that. And um, outside of those two campaigns, I have one that I'm working on that's a bit more long term, but the, I can't disclose information at the moment just because like, no talks, but yeah, I just... I'm just trying to give back as much as I can at the moment. And kind of just, you kind of spark something there with those last two answers with being able to kind of leverage your platform, but also having other interests outside of fashion. Have you ever thought about leveraging your current platform to grow a second account that's related to you, but more so into your other interests, like whether it be travel or wine or anything like that? You know, I have, and I think in the long run, that's something that I might dabble into just because I feel like I have... I want to give more and I want to, you know, just, just do more things that will make an impact, a positive impact in this world. So I definitely think it's part of my roadmap, but I don't know what that is at the moment. That's fair. And so outside of Instagram, just with life in general, if you were to pinpoint like your long-term goal, what would you say that is? My long-term goal? I just really want to travel as much as I can with my wife. (laughs) We've traveled a few times since uh, we've been married that have been pretty awesome. So I definitely want to just travel a bit more. I want to be involved in more, um, just, I want to be more involved with charities, just like nonprofits. No, that's awesome. And before I let you go, I want to, I ask everyone the same standard set of questions at the end of every interview. I used to call them rapid fire, but people said they aren't really rapid fire questions. So then I started calling it the Q and a, but then I realized it's a podcast and the whole thing is a Q and a, so that doesn't really make sense. So I don't have a name for this section, but the first question if you could go to dinner, you could take anybody dead or alive and you could take three people. Who do you take to dinner? Ooh, okay. I'm going to be taking Michael Jordan. I'm going to be taking Gary V, and I will be taking Denzel Washington. That would be quite the dinner. There's a lot of <laughs> alphas at that table. Yes. 
What is some of the best advice you've ever gotten? The best best advice. Um, I would say, give more than you than you ask for. Mm-hmm. I love that. What is what is one thing about you people wouldn't expect? One thing I, I'm a wine snob. <laughs> okay. <laughs> have you have you tried Empathy wines? I have not. That's actually on my list. I actually um I don't drink tequila honestly, but you know the Rock created his own te- tequila, Terramana, and actually just tried that and i thought it was really good but um, empathy is the next one on the list yeah that's awesome what is one thing that's so important everybody needs to know kindness always wins all right and for the last question i like to flip the script a little bit so instead of me asking the question it's you asking the question but it's not to me so pretend you have this crystal ball you can ask this crystal ball any question and you will get the 100 percent honest answer what is one question you want to know the answer to? Hmm. Will Instagram ever reveal what the algorithm updates are? <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. But I don't think they will. I mean, I know I'm not supposed to answer the question, but I don't think they will. I mean, it'd be great, but I, I unfortunately, I don't think they ever will. But I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on this podcast. It's for just giving me the, the honor of being your first interview. I genuinely appreciate it. It means a lot to me. I want to give you the floor. Where can the people find you? Plug anything and everything that you got right now. Yes. So first, thank you so much for having me. Um, it, was, it was awesome. I had a lot of fun. And you guys can find me on Instagram at Mr. Chuno3. Um, or you can just get more information about me on Mr. Chuno3.com. So that's it. Thank you so much for having me. And it's honestly truly um, a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, that means a lot. And I want to thank you once again for taking time to be on this podcast. I want to thank everybody for listening, whether you've listened the entire way through or you only listen to bits and pieces. I really appreciate you taking time to check this out. Everyone do me a big favor. Go and follow Raymond on Instagram. I'll make sure everything is linked in the show notes down below as well. If you'd also like to buy one of his subscription boxes, I highly recommend you check them out. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. If you'd like to follow the podcast, you can find us on Instagram at my social life podcast or YouTube by searching out my social life. As always, this podcast is powered by TrueFan. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.